Our scripture reading today is Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. You may find this in your pew Bible on page 964. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place here in these days? He asked them, What things? And they replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. And now our chief priests, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with them went up to the tomb and found it was just women had said, that's just as they had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, well, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that Moses should suffer these things, then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly saying, oh, stay with us because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went with them and stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while we were walking to us on the the road, and while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. And they were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told him what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Good morning, Village Church. It is an absolute pleasure to be with you today. So before I start sermonizing, I specifically want to say thank you to Roger and Tom for inviting me to be a part of the celebration of Village Church's 75 years. Um, It's a delight and an honor to be a part of the tradition and a part of what God has been doing in and through this church over time. Village Church has always been a missional church, and so it's no surprise that my own uh, journey to becoming a missionary uh, in Egypt started here on Mission Road. And I actually remember the first time that I spoke in front of a congregation, it was right here in this lectern. I was in sixth grade, and they, they had a little uh, wooden box that you would stand, and I could just peek over, 
And I remember reading a passage from the Old Testament, boldly mispronouncing all of the names I could find, and finishing up. But the thing that was most special for me that day, or in that occasion, was two days later, I received a piece of mail, which was a very rare thing for me in those days, opened it up to find a note from Dr. Bob, scrawled in green Sharpie on the bulletin from that day, thanking me for involvement in the service. I still remember the rest of the day and maybe the rest of the week, it was not difficult to be of good cheer. I'm currently a professor and the academic dean at the largest and oldest Protestant seminary in the Middle East. We have 620 students, and Village has supported us and our ministry there for the last 24 years. We have the privilege of training dynamic leaders for the Arab world who will be ministers, lay leaders, peacemakers, addiction counselors, media workers, and teachers, all aiming at reflecting the love of God in Jesus Christ to those around them. I want you to, to hear me say thank you. Thank you for the ways that you've walked with us, that you've supported us. Thank you especially for praying for us on those days that you see the, the, the bad headlines on our part of the world. It means the world to us to be in partnership with you in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So now, on to the sermon. Let us join in prayer. Gracious God, let the good news come, not only in word, but also in power, through the Holy Spirit, and with full assurance. In Jesus' name, amen. So our passage today actually takes place on the very first Easter Sunday. While there have been reports about Jesus' resurrection, the uncertainty and the doubt remain. We find two disciples walking on the road to Emmaus. They're not part of the twelve, but they would have been part of the larger group of people following Jesus, listening to his teaching, seeing his acts and deeds of power. While we know that one of them is named Cleopas, we know nothing about the identity of the other one. I've looked through, and this is a famous scene that people like to paint about. So Renaissance painters, and all through history, there's pictures of this scene that have been painted. And the overwhelming majority assume that it's two males that are walking along. I want to challenge that because they end up coming to a home that's in common. So I think it's at least possible that it's a, a man and his wife walking along that road together. In the Gospel of John, we hear mention of a, word, a man named Clopas and his wife Mary. Mary, the wife of Clopas, was there at the foot of the cross when Jesus died. So it's possible that this is simply a different spelling, and who we have is Cleopas with his wife Mary walking that road to Emmaus that day. We don't know for certain, but it's possible. They were almost certainly in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast, and they were on their journey home. Emmaus is about seven miles from Jerusalem, and it's a hilly course. So seven miles, if you want to conceptualize it, it's about the distance from here to just beyond Union Station downtown. Regardless, they are ordinary people involved in an extraordinary story. They're devastated with sadness and disappointment. They're confused and unsure of what to believe, but they had a lot to talk about and a lot to process together. Now, I don't know for sure, and none of you laughed at it, but I tend to think that Luke actually was smiling when he wrote this narrative. Because what you have is you have an unrecognizable Jesus who comes up to people who are talking deep in conversation and he says, what you talking about? He's that guy on the airplane that you do not want to be sitting next to on the transatlantic flight. <laughs> but Cleopas responds, and, and again, I, I can't say for sure because it's not written in the scripture, but I tend to think there might have been a little bit of exacerbation in his voice because he says this, and I quote, are you the only stranger in all of Jerusalem 
who does not know what has been happening in these days. The beauty of it is is that he's literally the only stranger in all of Jerusalem who does know what has been happening in these days. And again, you get this great laugh line from Jesus. What things? He's gone through Holy Week and says, what things? This is a key pivotal point in the story at this point. Do Cleopas and his partner brush off the the stranger and ask him to mind his own business, or do they take the opportunity that's in front of them? Remember the week that they just had. In one week, the one who they believed would redeem Israel had been betrayed, tortured, humiliated, and executed on a cross. They were devastated. Nevertheless, they tell the stranger all they know, and they honestly include their own doubts and questions. They opened their hearts to another person, and they risked vulnerability. It was precisely this openness that opened the way for Jesus to connect the dots for them on the further journey forward into Emmaus. The next pivotal point in the story comes when they get to Emmaus. And the scripture tells us that at that point, Jesus accelerated. So he starts walking faster to go on, and the stranger begins to get on. But the two decide that they need to put the safety of this stranger first. Travel could be dangerous alone at night, in the first century. So they opened their home to the stranger. It wasn't that sort of anemic non-invitation, come on in, it'd be great. No, it was actually urging him strongly to come inside. Now there's all sorts of ways that this could have gone wrong. We read about it in headlines today all the time. But they acted in compassion, and they took the opportunity to welcome a stranger in need. The New Testament is actually filled with different examples of people who invite Jesus to their house. Jairus asked him to come over when his daughter's sick and needs healing. We see Mary and Martha invite him into, his home, into their home at that time, and they want to hear his teaching. The Pharisees invite him because he's a popular and influential uh, figure in those days. But the really astonishing thing about our narrative today is that they did not invite Jesus into their home. They invited a stranger into their home. This is a literal playing out of what we see in Matthew 25, where we're told whenever we do it to the least of these, we do it to Christ. Quote, they saw him, a stranger, and invited him in. Then something amazing happens. They start into the meal, and their eyes are opened. They realize that this stranger, Jesus, did indeed know what had been happening in in Jerusalem over these days. They realized that Jesus was alive, that Jesus had defeated death and deserved their faith. All this happened because they opened their hearts to a stranger. The whole experience was transformative, and they got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem to tell the others. Now, I'm a distance runner. I used to run track and cross country for Shawnee Mission East, and I love imagining that this might have been this husband and wife's first 14-mile day. I want to suggest to you that this story is a story of ordinary people taking opportunities that are in front of them to reflect the love of God to others. On their mission road to Emmaus, they showed kindness, openness, love, and hospitality to someone who needed it. They weren't superheroes. They weren't geniuses. They weren't people of unlimited patience. Nevertheless, they acted as followers of Christ when opportunity arose. Based on their own encounters and experience of Jesus previously, they reflected grace to another in the contours of their own experience. 
Part of why I love this story so much is that it reminds me of how I experience Village Church. Like the two disciples, you try to open your hearts to the community and to the world around you in response to God's love. Like these two disciples, you are working hard to shine the light and the hope of Christ to the world around you. Now, I had the chance to work at Village right out of college, and I worked with Andy Wilson, Vic Hammond, and Lori Everhardy in the youth department. But I was always struck with the, the incredible myriad of ways that Village served in a missional capacity inside the church and outside the church. Sometimes our opportunities are easy, and they're even natural expressions of doing what we love to do most. I had this great gig as a youth leader. I loved working with high school students to begin with, taking kid, the village kids canoeing up in Minnesota, or backpacking in Yellowstone, or serving in mission trips in the Dominican Republic or Los Angeles, all of those things were me getting to do my very favorite things with my very favorite people. I had the chance of doing them with Zach Walker and with Will Brightsprock. What could be better? God gives us all predilections, gifts, talents, that help us reflect Christ's love to the world around us. Use those opportunities. Be light and salt using your passions for others. But at other times, the opportunities we face are truly hard and risky. Like those travelers on the road to Emmaus, we have to decide how do we reflect grace here and now? And do we trust God enough to try to do so? One of the most influential people in my Christian walk was a youth intern here at Village Presbyterian Church named Paul Childs. Paul was social, funny, athletic, and mischievous. And that's what made him such a great junior high leader for boys. He had a Bible that he kept by his bedside. And I thought that was great. You know, this is incredible devotion. What a wonderful Christian. And then I opened it one time, and it was the, the Bibles that they give away in sixth grade, or they used to do this back in Carol Cowden and Judy Cooper's day. And they were the black Bible that every sixth grader got one. And I opened it up, and instead of saying, this Bible presented to Paul Childs from Village Church, it was crossed out and edited. And it said, this Bible, stolen from Village Church by Paul Childs. And he at least had the decency to date it, even. <laughs> Paul loved people and reflected that love of Christ to me as a teenager. Paul was also a competitive triathlete and a very good one. And on September 7, 1986, Paul was so far ahead at the bike stage of the, of the triathlon that the, the police officer waved a truck across the course. Paul came over the crest and struck the car, or the truck, and died instantly. It was a tragic accident with terrible consequences. And 35 years later, I still carry Paul's picture in my wallet. Paul's parents were members here at Village Church, and they did something astonishing. In spite of their grief and brokenness, they knew that the accident was a mistake. It was utterly void of malice. And they also knew that there was a real chance that that guilt would destroy those people who were involved. It was unbearable to them to think that Paul's life could have been lived so fully for grace only to torment others in death. So they called up the uh, youth pastor at the time, Mike Vaughn, and they said, would you please invite the police officer, the truck driver, and the two race volunteers to come over to our home for tea and lemon bars? They came over. They cried together, they spoke of Paul, they spoke of forgiveness, and they spoke of hope. Paul's death could have led to bitterness and overwhelming guilt, but faith opened a way for hope. 
Hope of the resurrection, hope of forgiveness, hope that Christ is with us and can, can change reality no matter how awful the circumstances would be. In this 75th year of Village Church, I hope that we can look back and celebrate all that God has done in our time together in these 75 years. But I hope that we'll do it with an understanding that we want to go forward with that tradition, not with the hope of being the greatest uh, 1940s church of the 21st century, but rather to go forward with faithfulness, taking the opportunities that we find in our lives, in the diversity of work and ministry. Some of them will be natural, joyful expressions of your passions and of your deepest skills. But like Paul's parents, some of the opportunities will be awful and hard. At those times, remember that Christ meets us there in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring transformation and a better tomorrow. Please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for the witness of this church. We thank you for the ways that you have knit us together and knit us into the narrative that stretches all the way back to the days of the Bible and into the future with hope. Lord, we pray that you would give us courage, creativity, imagination, and energy to be able to reflect Christ's love, to be light and salt for a world that desperately needs it. We pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.